Okay, so um, thanks for coming everybody. I'm presenting here today based on my uh, PhD thesis where I did um, a comparative case study analysis of two of the campaigns that Tony's just been talking about, the international campaign to ban landmines and the cluster munitions coalition. Um, and I completely agree with him that these are terrible weapons. Um, they obviously have awful effects on people. Um, but I would see them as being a symptom of underlying causes. Um, and I kind of think it's more important to treat the causes of war, which I would see as being imperialism and unequal power relations um, rather than banning particular types of weapon. And what I'm arguing here today is that in the types of arguments that the NGO campaigns made, um, part of the arguments that they made actually legitimised um, an unequal um, international military order which is dominated by the West and legitimised um, Western ways of making war and intervention more broadly and so kind of undermined um, what they were trying to do which was to reduce the humanitarian impact um, of war through banning particular weapons. Um, so that's my kind of basic argument um, that I'm going to make and um, what I'm linking this to is the nature of the campaigns themselves. Um, Tony's been saying about how these were um, predominantly civil society campaigns and that the pressure was coming from civil society from below to ban these weapons. Um, but in fact, in analysing the campaigns, I found a very high level of financial and political dependence between the lead NGOs, the dominant NGOs that were involved in these campaigns, and sections of Western governments, international agencies, um, and powerful Western elites running foundations and so on. And that this kind of dependence, this lack of independence of the leading figures in the campaigns and the campaign headquarters affected the type of arguments um, that the campaigns made in favour of banning these weapons. Um, and this is kind of a different view of the relationship between civil society and the state to what we generally get in the kind of liberal or constructivist international relations literature on the role of civil society in the international system. Um, and even the whole language that people use, I think, generally um, can, mitigate, can militate against understanding um, the role of, of civil society in this context. So we talk about non-governmental organisations, which assumes from the start that they're separate from governments, whereas in fact um, very many of them, many of the most influential ones in particular, um, have a very high level of government funding and there's a very high degree of personnel circulation between people working for NGOs and people working for governments and international agencies. So I found in doing my research that it was actually a more enlightening part, point of departure to actually start from a Gramscian perspective on civil society, which assumes that the majority of civil society is actually part of an extended um, understanding of capitalist states. So what he calls an, um, an integral state and then, because I was coming at this from an international relations perspective, I looked at it in the context of the international system as a whole and whether these organisations were largely part of Western states and what did that mean for the type of arguments that they were making and the broader effects um, that they had. So just to kind of illustrate this a little bit graphically, um, on the left you have like a pluralist understanding of this kind of tree sector model of society where you have these three separate distinct spheres, state market and civil society, which are assumed to be meaningfully independent of each other and though there may be some overlap, there's an assumption that you have different actors in these spheres um, populated by different kinds of people doing different kinds of things for different kinds of reasons. Um, whereas from Gramsci's perspective, um, Gramsci is a Marxist, so um, he's starting from the point of view that the economic base or structure of society where goods are produced and distributed, where economic growth comes from, just sets the broad context in which everything else that happens in society happens. People have to survive and, and you know, live materially, um, first of all, before they can do anything else. And he's arguing that this is a very um, unequal economic base of society in which you have a class of capitalists controlling the means of production and that their power um, really sets the context in which states develop, in which civil society organisations develop. So what we would commonly refer to as the state, um, Gramsci calls political society, 
Um, so this is the formal institutions of government, um, such as you know, the police, the courts, government and state agencies. And he would see the primary role of government or political society in this sense as being about maintaining unequal class relations and maintaining um, control of resources by elites, um, primarily through force, through police, through military force, through the courts and so on. And then the role of the vast majority of civil society organisations, were intended or not, he sees as a hegemonic role, which in this context means um, making kind of arguments or developing ideas and ideologies which in the end legitimise um, the rule of a minority in society over the majority by legitimising the state and the use of force by the state and extrapolating this to international relations by legitimising the power of Western states in particular in the international system. Um, so I don't really have time to go into that massively, but that's just to give you a bit of an idea of the theoretical background to my talk. Um, so the landmines campaign began in 1992, and there's a reason why the issue of landmines becomes um, the subject of a campaign at that time, and why it becomes possible, I think, to talk about banning landmines at that particular point in history. 1992 is just a few years after the end of the Cold War, and what was just recently after happening was you had the end of an awful lot of proxy conflicts, um, where either side had been funded and supplied with weapons, including landmines, um, by the West, um, primarily by the US, or by Russia or China. So in countries like um, Cambodia, Mozambique, Afghanistan, you had this huge legacy from the Cold War of landmine contamination that was being cleared up now by um, UN um, peace building and peacekeeping missions um, going in in large numbers into these countries for the first time in decades and clearing up um, this mess that had been left behind. So in the 90s, you actually had an awful lot of Western peacekeepers and Western aid workers being killed and injured by landmines for the first time, whereas previously this had just been a problem for people in poor developing countries where the majority of landmines are, and it wasn't an issue that was taken up um, by the international community. Um, you also had a lot of new wars starting in this period as well due to the breakup of the former Eastern Bloc, so you did a use, new usage of mines um, in places like Yugoslavia, which again was making it a problem for the UN and for international aid workers. Um, also interacting with this is the ongoing process of the arms product cycle, which is a basic process in the development of weapons similar to other kind of um, consumer products even, where initially when a product is a new product or a new weapon is developed, it's high tech, it's expensive, and it gives a particular advantage in terms of weapons to the most advanced military powers, which after the end of the Cold War um, are overwhelmingly Western states and overwhelmingly the US in particular. So landmines in the early 90s, particularly the kind of um, dumb conventional mines that didn't have any self-destruct mechanisms, low-tech um, mines, were becoming more of a weapon of the weak. Um, the cheapest landmines were selling for $3 a go. They were becoming much less important to the military strategies of Western states as well, because due to the end of the Cold War, there wasn't a chance of a huge big land invasion by the Soviet Union of Europe anymore, which was one of the main defensive usages of um, conventional landmines. And with cluster munitions as well in the early 2000s, there was something of a similar process beginning to happen with cluster bombs, um, which had been first used by the US to car carpet bomb um, Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos in the 1960s when they invented the weapons. But by the 2000s, they had become one of the cheapest type of airdrop weapons were these old-fashioned cluster bombs, and they were selling for as little as $60 per submunition. But then at the same time, at the other end of the scale, you had the development of really high-tech um, new kinds of smart cluster munition that had their own individual precision-guided um, um, systems and that had self-destruct mechanisms. Um, and these were retailing at, say, $28,000 a submunition. So obviously, it's only the most advanced um, military powers that were able to afford those. So even though the Western powers still had an awful lot of landmines and older models of cluster munitions in their arsenals, they were becoming less military imp militarily important um, to their um, military strategies and relatively more important to um, poor developing country armies and non-state armed groups um, who were getting their hands on these weapons as they became cheaper and also even production of these weapons was moving to developing countries as well because they were becoming low cost commodities that you can only make a profit out of if you've got low labour costs. Um, 
Um, then the other kind of ideological development that accompanied the end of the Cold War, I think um, Noam Chomsky um, put it very well when he said, with the Soviet Union gone, either the policies would have to change or new justifications would have to be devised. And what he's talking about is justifications for Western imperialism, for interventions into poor developing countries to exploit resources for geopolitical reasons and so on. Um, so what we see from the 1990s onwards is the US immediately looking for new justifications for its continuation of its imperialist policy um, in the South. And you can see this actually as early as the 1990 US national security strategy, where suddenly there's this focus on lower order threats, new threats, non-military threats, um, unconventional threats that are suddenly threatening the US, um, but w which weren't a major concern before when there was the justification of anti-communism. Um, so generally you either have um, anti-terrorism now as being a justification for Western military interventions or the other popular justification is humanitarian reasons or human security as it's come to be known. Um, and one side effect of this, one positive in a way side effect, which I think the campaigns to ban landmines and cluster munitions were able to tap into, was that if wars are justified for humanitarian reasons, um, say beginning particularly in the 90s with the US intervention in Somalia, also in Yugoslavia, particularly in Kosovo, that was illegal under international law, so a, ju a humanitarian justification was put forward for it in order, in order to legitimise it. But because you have more of an emphasis on humanitarian justifications, there's more attention to is this war being carried out actually in a humanitarian way? Um, are weapons being used that kill a large amount of civilians? And it was this change in the justification of war that was exploited in a way by the campaigns to ban landmines and cluster missions because they were able to say, look, these weapons are really clearly in indiscriminate. There's nothing humanitarian about these weapons. Um, but the sort of flip side of this is that it legitimises more high-tech, precision or smart weapons, which have also become a central feature of how advanced military powers justify um, their conduct during wars. So say, for example, after the US attack in Fallujah in 2005, you had US military commanders um, saying that not a single dumb bomb had been used in attacking um, Fallujah, and there has been increasing use of smart weapons, and there's always a lot of attention to that in media coverage, this kind of how impressive this high technology is that you can just pick out individual targets. And um, this kind of distracts away from the wider carnage associated with an imperialist intervention. The cost of the war in Iraq, for example, is much more than the people who were killed by US smart bombs. It's the whole wider chaos caused um, as a result of the intervention. Um, and in general, an argument that I'm making in relating to these campaigns is that um, of these two justifications for intervention now, um, in general, kind of liberal um, or progressive kind of type elites, social democrats, people in liberal parties, tend to put more emphasis on the humanitarianism, human security justifications for Western foreign policy, um, whereas conservatives like George W. Bush, when he was president of the US, prefer the kind of more old school national security anti-terrorism arguments, but you generally have some combination of the two. So say, for example, most recently in relation to Syria, the initial justification that Obama put forward for a US intervention was humanitarian, and um, now the actual justification that um, proved more effective for them was in combating ISIS um, in Syria and Iraq. Um, so just to relate this to the actual campaigns themselves, um, there was big NGO campaigns obviously pushing for these two bans, um, but as Tony described in terms of lobbying the UN and governments, there was an awful lot of support coming from particular elites. And I just have a few photographs of some of individual elites, but they're representing not so much themselves as individuals, but the kind of institutions and political orientations and sections of elites that they represent. So probably the most high profile backer of the landmine campaign was Princess Diana, um, which obviously is a member of a royal family, um, is a particular um, very old fashioned type of elite, but got an awful lot of um, publicity for the campaign. And below her is George Soros, um, who was the number one individual donor to the last two, two years or so of the landmine campaign, supplied about a third of its funding. He's obviously a, a billionaire philanthropist who's made millions from speculation on financial markets. 
Um, then in the middle we have Lloyd Axworthy, who, as Tony mentioned, was the Canadian Foreign Minister. He was a member of the Liberal Party government at the time, so it's, it's that kind of end of the political spectrum. And subsequent to his involvement in being a leading figure in the landmine campaign, he was one of the main driving forces behind um, the development of the concept of the responsibility to protect the repackaging of humanitarian intervention um, by the International Commission on State Sovereignty and Intervention, I think I might have got that acronym a bit wrong, um, in 1999-2000, and he ended up on the board of Human Rights Watch as well. So there was very close relations between those sort of um, liberal political elites and some of the leading NGOs in the campaign. Um, similarly, um, this is Senator Patrick Leahy, um, who was one of the main backers of the landmine campaign and the close stimulation campaign in the US. And the reason why I have him there um, is because he's kind of representing how there was support for these campaigns within the US political establishment from a kind of a liberal or progressive wing of the US political establishment, but still very much elites part of the establishment who would generally support US foreign policy, but be in favour of this more humanitarian gloss on it, I suppose. Um, and then up at the top, I have Norway, the Norwegian foreign minister. At the time of the Close to Missions campaign, Norway was the main backer of that campaign, and they had a, a Labour Party-led government, which had very close links with the Norwegian NGO, Norwegian People's Aid, which is one of the, the main um, NGOs leading the campaign, which is kind of like the... NGO end of the Norwegian Labour movement, which is linked in with the Labour Party. So again, you had very um, close relations there. Um, and then you also had backing for the campaign um, from um, Nelson Mandela for the Landmines campaign and Grasa Michelle, his um, second wife, who ended up being an education minister in Mozambique. So you had a similar kind of, I suppose, internationalised liberal elites also being enlisted um, into the campaign in developing countries as well, and big backing from the United Nations, in part due to the actual practical effect the weapons were having um, on their operations. It's the same kind of problem with close nations in that they leave around a lot of unexploded ordnance with the UN is, is tasked with clearing up. Um, and then just to point to some of the leading NGOs that were involved um, in the campaigns, um, both campaigns ended up with hundreds of member NGOs, but in studying it, you can see that there's really quite a small number of lead NGOs um, that provided most of the funding, who made the dominant arguments in the campaigns, and were the ones who dealt with um, elites in governments and in international organisations, and were the real kind of movers and shakers in the campaign. Um, the three organisations on the left, the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, Human Rights Watch and Handicap International, um, were NGOs based in the US and in France and, and Belgium. So they're all Western NGOs, which kind of undermines the notion of global civil society. This is really elements of Western civil society, and in particular, kind of professional middle class elements of Western society that have good connections, that have access to elites that are talking a similar language, come from similar backgrounds. So it isn't like a kind of a mass campaign from below of poor people in developing countries who are actually affected by landmines and unexploded ordnance, but by Western professionals acting on their behalf. Um, so, say for example, Human Rights Watch is mainly made up of lawyers, Handicap International doctors and Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation had a lot of links, obviously, to um, the US military. It started off as kind of a fairly radical anti-war organisation, but by the 90s it had kind of been integrated into the kind of US democratic political establishment as a kind of a lobbying organisation. Um, and then with the Close Nations Coalition, Human Rights Watch and Handicap International were again um, leading organisations in that, but two other organisations were Norwegian People's Aid, as I mentioned, the kind of NGO wing of the Norwegian labour movement, um, which gets about 80 to 90% of its funding from the Norwegian government, and Landmine Action, which was, had been set up as the UK campaign to ban landmines during the landmines campaign. Um, and was the organisation that was the head office for the Close to Munitions Coalition in London. So there was a big crossover development of one campaign um, out of the other. And just in terms of the overall funding of the campaign, um, the concentration of funding from supportive Western governments was even stronger in the Close to Munitions um, Coalition. Um, in 2007-2008, the Close to Munitions Coalition head office got 60% of its funding from the Norwegian government, and there was a negligible level of public fundraising, um, less than 1% in public donations. 
Um, so these were really campaigns that were um, largely funded by sections of Western states like foreign affairs departments and um, aid departments and parts of the UN, which I argued are primarily um, aimed around um, legitimising um, Western power in the international system. And there was a lot of opposition um, from militaries within Western states. No military ever wants to give up weapons, even if they're not particularly central from a strategic perspective anymore. Um, so there was a kind of a battle within these states between a more far-sighted view of the legitimacy of Western actions and maintaining popular support at home for continued Western interventions versus a kind of a short-sighted military approach that just wanted to hang on to weapons. And I think the fact that the countries such as Canada and Norway, which don't have very big um, militaries and are primarily members of NATO as a way of increasing the legitimacy of NATO actions because they're kind of seen of good international citizens, could more easily buy into um, the arguments in favour of cutting out these weapons that were giving Western military actions um, bad press more easily than the US, which is a major military power, is, the Pentagon is more dominant and it was going more with just that straightforward military logic of, of hanging on to weapons. Um, so I just want to illustrate some of these arguments that developed, um, that NGOs put forward um, in that context. Um, so first of all, there's the whole idea of singling out particular weapons as being a unique aberration implies that in general how Western states conduct wars um, is okay, is humanitarian, is civilised, and a lot of the language that was used in this context kind of buys into that notion. So we have Ray, Ray McGrath, who was one of the leading figures in the landmines campaign and a former um, British military officer. Um, he was very clear to make out this isn't a crusade against war, it's not a disarmament issue, we're not anti-war, we're just focusing on a particular weapon. Um, similarly, with the Cluster Munitions Coalition, um, they're emphasising how armed, they're making arguments like armed forces have invested in these precision guided smart weapons to avoid killing and injuring civilians, which isn't really true because the main reason why armed forces develop these weapons is because they're more efficient weapons, not because um, they're more discriminate between civilians and military targets. And then saying that the use of close to munitions belies a commitment to civilian protection. Um, then another related aspect of these arguments was saying that landmines and cluster munitions were outdated weapons, that they weren't that militarily useful to Western states anymore. So this is a really pragmatic argument that featured less in the kind of public um, discourse of the campaigns, but more a kind of a, um, an insider elite um, discourse aimed at um, Western militaries and diplomats, but which also did get out into the public sphere as well. So the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation in the US, they had a huge national advertising campaign highlighting that landmines had killed more US soldiers in Vietnam than any other weapon. Let's not, history, let, let's not history, let history repeat itself. Um, whereas from the perspective of the Vietnamese, you might say, let history repeat itself. Um, so they were certainly taking the point of view of you know, the Western military and in making these kind of arguments. And there was continuing portrayal of both landmines and close to munitions as being Cold War relics, they're outdated, you know, you don't want to use these outdated weapons anymore. And I have a few more quotes um, just there, which I, I won't read out, but you can see just kind of generally making, making that argument quite explicitly that these weapons are more useful to our enemies than they are to us. So us and the use of just we and us um, in, in that way. Um, and... Just tying this in with um, a lot of the lead NGOs as well actually almost gave explicit endorsement to the development of more high-tech um, smart weapons. Now, I'm not saying all NGOs did this. There was loads of NGOs involved in these campaigns, but the lead dominant NGOs that gave most of the funding and were closest to international elites um, did make these arguments. So the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, they actually published a whole kind of book called Winning in North Korea Without Landmines, outlining an alternative military strategy that the US could use to defeat North Korea without using landmines. And Human Rights Watch um, described the development of smart cluster munitions um, as a place where military necessity and humanitarian concern coincide. 
And in fact, they were so um, complimentary about one particular smart cluster munition, which actually ended up being banned under the eventual treaty um, in, in 2004, that this description of the weapon was actually used by the manufacturer Textron Defence Systems on its website as a product endorsement, um, which <laughs> I doubt Human Rights was very pleased with that outcome. And then Simon Conway, who was one of the co-chairs of the Cluster Munitions Coalition um, in the, the UK, just illustrating how these weren't marginal arguments, these were leading figures in the campaigns who were doing the negotiations with states for making these arguments. Um, he's saying, we need weapons that hit the right targets and kill the right people. Killing the wrong people is the best recruiting sar sergeant for a new breed of terrorists. Let's stop losing wars, let's stop killing civilians, let's ban cluster bombs. Um, so I suppose... Just to finish up, the argument that I'm making is that in trying to ban these weapons, they actually bought into wider narratives that legitimise um, the Western dominated military order and use of force um, by the West to further um, foreign policy objectives. Um, and this is illustrated how there was very little wider opposition to wars in which Western states were involved um, during the period of the cluster munitions campaign. So there would have been individual NGOs who were opposed to the war in Iraq, who were opposed to the war in Afghanistan, but um, there wasn't a sense that they were arguing for ban on these weapons as part of a wider opposition to these wars. In fact, in some cases you got the opposite, where you had um, the Cluster Munitions Coalition um, head office um, making arguments like um, the use of cluster munitions by the UK and Iraq is undermining the wider legitimacy of the invasion. Um, and this is reflected also in, during the campaign, the hiring of Western military experts to advise NGOs. Um, one of the most egregious examples I came across from this was the hiring um, by Human Rights Watch of a guy in the US military who had been in charge of targeting um, US bombing of Iraq during the invasion. And he actually left the US military and went straight into a job with Human Rights Watch. And literally less than two weeks later, he was sent to Iraq to examine the humanitarian impact of bombs that he had sent to that country himself. Um, so, you know, that's just a really stark illustration, I think, of where these kind of pragmatic approaches to campaigning and just focusing on banning particular weapons and, you know, can, can lead you. Um, so... In conclusion, um, my argument is that these campaigns were successful because um, they were able to build alliances with Western liberal elites and professionals. They made arguments that um, legitimised the wider co conduct of Western militaries, um, bought into notions around humanitarian interventions and smart weapons, um, and also strengthened a broader framework of international humanitarian law, um, which... I would argue, again, from a Gramscian perspective, is more about legitimising more really than limiting or restraining it. Um, and I think I'm a bit over time, so I might just leave it there. Ultimately, I think it has a, a broader purpose of legitimising um, and reinforcing the use of force rather than limiting it.